Tonight, we have the incredible, amazing privilege of talking to Stephen Fry. Um, I cannot imagine there's anyone on this planet who hasn't heard of him or any of the surrounding planets. His list of activities and achievements is enormous. It's book sized. Um, he's just an incredible person. And I was, the suggestion for talking to him came from Mike Inns, who I've worked with for years. He's a fantastic designer. And apparently he went to the same school as Stephen and his brother and knew his sister too. And he set it up. And for that, I'm incredibly grateful. And I'm amazed and really grateful that Stephen gave us the time. And he did. And it was wonderful. Yeah, I mean, for me, like, if there was ever a moment that I was more grateful that you were you. <laughs> <laughs> and more frustrated that you get to have all the fun and I can't join in. I always feel like that with all of these podcasts as they start and then something really interesting gets going and I'm like, why am I not in this conversation? And, <laughs> and I really wanted to jump into this one, obviously, because Stephen Fry, after you and John Anderson, is probably the most familiar male voice in my whole life, particularly growing up. So I think, if anything, it should have been me talking to him. But there you go. That's where the chips fell. <laughs> yes. Well, it's, it's funny because he did talk a lot about Wagner. And in 2008, when you and I finished working on the Puccini Festival and designing for opera, we went and saw a bunch of Wagner operas at Glyndebourne, um, the Meister Singers and Tristram. And I remember you and I chatting and saying it would have been brilliant fun working on a Wagner opera. And it would have. So. Definitely have had your work get a lot of airtime. <laughs> yes. It was, yeah, he, he did really talk quite enthusiastically about Wagner. And it would have been interesting to have had that particular part of the conversation with you on board. Oh, well, one day. I quite agree. I know nothing about Wagner, but I definitely should have been there. <laughs> yes. Well, it was, it was fantastic talking to him. And I say talking to him, but, you know, I had one or two words and Stephen did all the hard work. <laughs> Yeah, which is lucky, really, because people get to hear you every week. So it's good to have a chat. <laughs> and I think if you've got Stephen Fry, who else needs to be there anyway? <laughs> that's Well, that's true, actually. That's true. Um, yeah, at every stage of my life, he's been doing something that I found totally compelling whether it was Blackadder when I was younger and then there was Harry Potter that he voiced and QI and his Mythos book I loved and Fry's English Delight. I mean, there's a million things that uh, we were talking about it before. Fry's English Delight, by the way, for anyone who hasn't listened to any of those, for me is what particularly like, I love anything about the English language. Um, and also learning Japanese, a lot of Japanese uses English words. So it's just amazing to hear the evolution previous and then see where it goes. But yeah, I mean, there's so much, I'm sure everyone knows about all of these things, but if you don't, I really love that. Apparently Stephen is connected to the chocolate family. Fries. Oh yes, yeah, for anyone who doesn't know or is in America, um, I don't know if they have it there, Fry's Turkish Delight is a chocolate with Turkish delight inside, which is why his program is called Fry's English Delight. He did another project on words, which I loved the title of. It was called Current Puns. <laughs> See, I'm laughing immediately this time. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's, it's really interesting, because when I was um, working in America at the Academy of Art in San Francisco, and um, I just had my third book published, I told them that we we delayed it while it was being translated into American and they couldn't understand what I was talking about. And I said, yeah, it's kind of normal now for books to be translated into American. I, I said, even 
even Harry Potter was translated into American. And not only was it translated, it meant there were two different audio books. The English English one narrated by Stephen Fry and the American English one also narrated by an English reader, strangely enough. But nevertheless, a different translation. And it was odd. Um, the, Stephen's best friend, I, I've read somewhere that Stephen's best friend is Hugh Laurie, who was George III in Black, George IV in Blackadder. And you had that little thing about English American translations, didn't you? Yeah, it was my friend who showed me this when she went to America and married an American. I don't know where she found this. Um, I don't know who made this. Credit to that person. Comment if it was you. But it's a picture of Hugh Laurie as George IV making a very contemptuous face as he says, my face when Americans call chips French fries. My face when Americans call crisps, chips. My face when Americans call chocolate globonauts, candy bars. My face when Americans call motorized Rollingham's, cars. My face when Americans call wonder boxes, a PC. My face when Americans call beef Wellington ensemble with lettuce, a hamburger. <laughs> There's millions of these. Oh, I like this one. My face when Americans call a nittity, wittity, sheepity, sleepity, a sweater. <laughs> but I really like the idea that America, someone American made this up because they think English people, um, their words are ridiculous. And speaking as an English person in Japan and looking at the expressions I get when I use British English, English words for certain things, I know that's not just Americans who look incredulous at our words for stuff but I think they're charming <laughs> <laughs> yes it would have been wonderful to get him talking about words but he talked about Wagner a little bit about the future and it was brilliant having him on Stephen a genius thank you so much here he is I, I guess the question I would ask is, um, obviously I have a visual perspective on things and uh, my experience of Wagner has varied from, I, I would say the music has always been extraordinary, but sometimes the sets are incredibly minimalist, mm. which in a six hour performance is testing. And sometimes they're quite beautiful, but it seems to me that if you're going to be there I don't know. I know a lot of musicians who will close their eyes and listen and wouldn't expect it to be a visual experience at all. Yes, I mean, that's true of all opera, not just Wagner. Um, people, you know, there are always people who get very annoyed by what they call the directocracy, the, the rule of the director and the designer in the world of opera. Um, they just want to hear they want to be able to go to the crush bar of, of the Royal Opera House and talk about the tessitura and the coloratura and the uh, various details of the music and what voice so-and-so is in and what voice. Uh, and, and if you say to them, what did you think of the design? They go, oh my dear, I never even looked uh, because uh, th they have a kind of snobbery about the theatrical side of it. Um, they would be just as sh shocked if uh, um, Wagner was done with with um, Nordic horns and furs, uh, you know, like that ghastly man who, who invaded the Congress the other day. If, 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 if they all look like that, um, you know, with, with, with um, Viking wear, people would be horrified. Um, one of Wagner's last statements was Kinderschaft Neues, um, children, uh, shape anew, you know, do it differently. Uh, I don't think he would have stood it for a minute if, uh, if um, uh, the world of uh, the ring and, and his other works had been stuck in some sort of weird time zone. And it is true that some directors and designers have written an essay on the stage, which is a thing you do in theater sometimes. People have, I mean, in the centenary production of the Ring uh, was directed by Patrice Chéreau and is regarded by one as one of the greatest performances uh, that Bayreuth has ever seen. But the, the orchestra was 
conducted by the great Pierre Boulez, of course, and, and that, that was a, an astonishing coming together of different traditions and talents. It, it closed a circle musically of the original worship of Wagner that the uh, young French modernists like Debussy uh, felt and Ravel, um, and then they turned their back on him quite violently. Um, Debussy, of course, wrote a very famous uh, um, parodies of Wagner. Uh, but if you if you read his letters when he was young, he was obsessed with Wagner. Everybody was. Um, the, the point about him as a, as, a, as a creative artist, as Alex Ross, Ross has shown in his wonderful new book, Wagnerism, um, is, is that the shadow he left over the 20th century is unavoidable. And even if you loathe Wagner, and plenty do for all kinds of reasons, not just his vile anti-Semitism and his bombastic writing and, and all the rest, uh, but for, for more psychological artistic reasons, they distrust the power of his music. But even if you loathe him, like Stravinsky did, for example, um, the influence is that of a negative influence. Uh, Stravinsky moved into an opposite direction, which was a result of influence in the same way that, uh, you know, um, uh, two uh, poles of a magnet repel, um, that, that is an influence. Being repelled is an influence. Um, so I don't think anybody can deny the influence of Wagner um, as, uh, in terms of his art and his music and his approach to art and creativity. He, um, I mean, you know, even down to the comical absurdity of the way he dressed with his crushed velvet berets and so on, became a, an archetype for a certain sort of artist. The arrogance, the absolute assurance of the fact that artists are the legislators of the world and they are a superior form of being, um, which connected, of course, with his relationship with Nietzsche and um, uh, with his rejection of the bourgeois and uh, of so much of, of what we consider Victorian values, which, have, which still exist in our own world. So Wagner is still a threat to order. Um, he's still revolutionary. Uh, and despite the association with fascism and Nazism and uh, uh, the awful side of his, uh, uh, of his nature, um, that is an important part of his appeal to current artists, um, uh, by which I mean designers and directors who are thrilled by the opportunity to present on the stage something that both can uh, interpret his work and interpret his reputation. So a lot of uh, Wagnerian productions are actually uh, essays on Wagner. So, for example, at Bayreuth a few years ago, there was a, a, a Parsifal, a brilliant Parsifal, which showed um, Wanfried, uh, Wagner's house in Bayreuth, in the background with um, spray, ca spray canned uh, swastikas on it. It was set during the war. Uh, there, there was a military hospital. It absolutely engaged with the whole idea of the black malignant reputation of Wagner and Bayreuth and Nazis, it, it embraced it full fold. So you can take the Parsifal as a purely spiritual experience, as a religious experience, as sacred experience, as he himself called it, uh, um, or, or, or you can uh, deal with it as a, a cultural artifact and comment on its nature in society and its place in the repertoire of of, of, of our you know, artistic um, works that we, we, we recognize. And, and that's the richness and depth of the Wagnerian legacy and of all our art, of course, is um, it, it, when it's performance art and there's a mediating, uh, a mediating artist comes in between, an interpretive artist, in other words. I mean, obviously a painter has his paint and his, his canvas or her canvas. Um, and um, there's no one else mediating apart from a gallery sucking up all the money, obviously. <laughs> um, but in, in the case of Wagner, as in Shakespeare or, or other performance art, there is this extra element where an artist comes in to interpret what, 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 has, been, what has been written in order to make it live. Uh, so, you know, the ring doesn't live as a text. It only, it only lives when, when it's in performance in, and it might be on a record. So you could say the ring is alive when you're listening to the Schulte or the Wengler or something, but also when you're sitting on the uncomfortable seats of Bayreuth or in, in some other uh, theater or opera house around the world. Uh, and then you're being led through it by a team of, of creative interpreters. 
a director, a conductor, a choreographer, a movement director, um, a, 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 a visual designer and costume designer. There are all these elements that add to it, aren't there? So, so it is a um, it is a, it, it, it is obviously an exciting opportunity for artists to make a mark, and the idea that all a designer or a director has to be is is to drape a sort of transparent cloak over it to, to make themselves invisible and let the work speak as it is in its pure sense suggests that there is a pure sense of a work and there isn't it, it, it only comes alive through interpretation I think so it does mean that all of us who love Wagner are bound to be disappointed or occasionally enraged or bored by an, uh, uh, a team's a creative team's interpretation of it by their production you say you go along to LA or Washington um, State, to, you know, the Seattle Opera or to, to the Met or to, you know, Munich or wherever you go around the world where there's a, a ring or, a, or some Wagner being produced. And the chances are you'll go, oh dear, what were they thinking of? That raked stage. Oh, those costumes, that plastic. What was they, what were they trying to say? You know, there's, there's going to be that. Or there might be, blimey, that blew me away. I had never seen anything like the intensity of it. And sometimes, as you rightly say, it follows, it follows a fashion, a wider world fashion. So after the Second World War, there was a fashion for what we now call minimalism. Um, so Gunther Wagner and, and various others, Gertz Friedrich gave a famous production at the uh, Covent Garden, which was huge um, rostra. Uh, which are plain rostra that just sort of moved, but no, nothing, it was almost in, in the same way that Islamic art has nothing representative. In those productions, there was nothing representative at all. That there was, there, there, that there was only these elements, these moving elements in the background, these rostra that, you know, they were vast and expensive and on great hydraulic, you know, p poles and pistons and things. But that, that was a fashion that lasted from the 60s right through to the late 70s. And, and then there were the more abstract designs those kind of strange spaghetti um, or rather Tagliatelle style um, jungles that were in the English National Opera production, the the, the, uh, uh, the Reginald Goodall pr productions, uh, you know, with Rita Hunter and Albert, Alberto Remedios, the great um, uh, tradition there where they toured around uh, England a lot and were hugely successful. And, and then you noticed in the 80s and 90s that there was a return to not exactly naturalism but elements of putting in the real world either uh, Victorian world so you'd have the gods with stovepipe hats and beards and looking like industrialists and so on and then there'd be other ones where it's set in contemporary contemporary world and uh, I went to see, I saw a production in in, in Petersburg um, St. Petersburg um, uh, with uh, Gergi um, um, Valerie Gergiev um, uh, um, and the Kirov, uh, or used to be the Kirov, um, you know what they're called now, um, Mariinsky, um, and uh, he he did it using um, uh, Ossian uh, folk tales. So you know, from from, from his own part of uh, of wider Russia. So so there are all kinds of possibilities like that. So uh, I I I'm not you know I get very annoyed if I sit in an audience and I find there's a lot of snobbish middle aged boring people booing because they don't like the production. I think, oh, come on. Is that how? Point oh, God, yes. Famously, if I write this booing. I mean, absolutely. It, it, it's one of the last bastions, opera, of, of booing, of clacks, um, where people come to cheer or people come to boo. And, and they boo. I mean, they really boo. I mean, there was one just a couple of years ago that was booing and booing at Bayreuth. Um, uh, be, uh, uh, and uh, the whole point of going to 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 a, a great art, a, a great sort of festival of art of any kind, is that it's a risk. Artists are exciting because they risk. Everything they do is a risk. Uh, it, it might be hated, it might be mis misunderstood, it might be taken to be uh, pol politically dangerous or sour or sexually odd or, you know, there are all kinds of things that art does because it pushes against... Uh, uh, against everything that's comfortable for us and and reminds us of dark things in us and of um, uh, our, our awful flaws and weaknesses and of our savage and weird desires and well, you know there's a lot of there's a lot in art that we should be afraid of and and if we're not then it's bland and it's not really art in in, in my view so yeah but and, and some people would say that the, the booing is all part of the fun you know um, but 
the usual thing in opera, you're absolutely right to your opening question, is that people cheer the orchestra and the singers and the conductor, and then they boo the designer and the director. <laughs> ah, well, I, I must admit that's an interesting take on it. I mean, if you went to see a performance of Beethoven, you wouldn't expect theater, but I think... No, but that's because um, there's a vast difference between uh, uh, reciting music, pure music, which is abstract uh, yes. and exists in the head of the listener, yes. um, and uh, drama. And, and drama is very different. There are all kinds of mediating forces uh, with drama. The performance, the actor, the, uh, the singer-actor, the, the uh, designer, um, the director, um, and that it's a very, very different experience. It happens to use music, but as Wagner would say, music is no more important than the poetry, as he would call it, the language that is being sung, or indeed the costume and the ideas, the philosophy behind it. So he would not privilege music over words in Tristan, for example, or indeed over the philosophy of Schopenhauer, which he was so obsessed with when writing um, Tristan. So, um, of course, it's a very different experience going to a, a musical concert, going to hear the Eroica in the Queen's Hall or whatever, is bound to be a very different, you want there just to close your eyes and listen. And some people like to watch the, the bows going up and down on the violin desk or to watch the, the conductor swinging his shoulders. But generally speaking, the idea is that the, the, the music is penetrating you. And there's, that's the key excitement. And you, you know, um, so yeah, that's why. I, can I posit an idea for you? I would- Go on. In my experience, if the visual is as overwhelming as the music, they collaborate to make it just incredible. Yes. And if you're sitting Quite. there, I, I would, took my daughter to see Tristan and Soul, and mm. the set consisted of a tube, which if my memory serves me while we're Where was it, do you remember? Yes, it was in Glyndebourne. In oh, Glyndebourne, I saw the Glyndebourne Tristan, yeah. Okay. And it did drive me mad that there was nothing else to look at. But yes, Tristan is a very, very difficult one to do there, particularly the second act, which is my favourite act in all opera, in fact. And yet, basically, they are just in a garden at night, um, standing next to each other. Th th there's nothing you can do. They can't touch each other because the whole of that act um, builds towards them coming close to each other. And then they're interrupted as King Mark comes striding on. Rette dich, Tristan, uh, if you remember, is the, is the great sort of line as the Curtis interruptus of that moment. And so all they do is they stand there and, and some people would say with Tristan in particular, that its best productions have been what they call um, concert performances or platform performances where you just get the singers in a row in front of the orchestra and you don't even pretend that it's a drama. There's no set. Um, everybody's on at the same time and it's just the music. And let your imagination build the pictures and be on a ship in act one and be in Cornwall in act three. Um, yeah, I think that that, that is a, a perfectly legitimate and understandable thing. But, you know, you, I, don't, I think creating rules for uh, opera only works if the visuals and the audio are absolutely matched, I think is, is wrong. I don't think that's true. I think you can have entirely satisfactory productions where the music is fantastic and the visuals are ghastly or where the production is so delightful um, and the music is fine. I mean, for a very good example of that is uh, in Ingmar Bergman's film version of a Magic Flute. The music is perfectly ordinary. It's sung in Swedish, so it's subtitles. But the drama, the way he films it, the, the, the lightness of touch, the, the existence of the theatre in which you're watching it being performed, so it's a performance of a performance, means that you're, what you're enjoying is a film in which Mo Mozart, of all people's music, is almost secondary. It's charming and it's delightful, but he makes it what it actually was when, when, when Mozart and Schikaneda performed it, which was a, uh, uh, an entertainment for the people. And so you can have that, or you can have one where it's the other way around. The music is superb, but the background is awful. Neither is invalid. I don't think we have to have such extraordinary standards where we demand an explosion of visual perfection, an explosion of performance perfection, an explosion of audio perfection and musical perfection, which means we can go, yes, 
that's all right then. The, the fact is all art tends towards perfection, but, but fails just as all living and all life does. And by definition, perfection cannot be achieved. Otherwise um, the word perfect is, is the wrong word to use because perfect means finished. But it should be a target, known. don't you think? It's a target, yes, yeah. That a man's reach should exceed his grasp or what's a heaven for, as Robert Browning put it. That's absolutely right. Yes, we aim for it, we stretch, and it is the act of stretching that is the excitement in art, not the arrival. It's the journey that matters. I, I, there's two films that I think about when I think of Wagner. One of them is the German Expressionist movie, Die Nibelung. Mm. And I always thought that would be amazing with a Wagner soundtrack. Mm. It certainly would. I mean, I think... Uh, it, it, I think there's a, a great argument to say that uh, German and Austrian Expressionism, which were the first great, um, great artistic movements in cinema, both owed a huge amount to, to, to Wagner, to, to Wagnerian production. There's a tradition through Max Reinhardt and, and, and others, which, which shows, I think, a very clear connection. And that uh, the Max Offels and the Murnau and all these great filmmakers of the early years of German and Austrian cinema, I think uh, you're absolutely right. There is something very akin to the Wagnerian manner in that, that, uh, that, that mixture of the, um, the psychological depth and the extremity of expression, which gives its name expressionism, of course. So uh, yeah, I also, I, my, my, for years, I've had this idea that if, if only I, you know, if I was Elon Musk, I would do it tomorrow, of course, which is um, an animated vibe. Um, I, I would ask, uh, you know, everyone, uh, uh, Anselm uh, um, uh, Kiefer, David Hockney, all the greatest living artists, I would say, come on, let, you, you, okay, David, which do you want to do? Do you want to do Rheingold? Do you want to, or, or you'd say, do you want to do the gods? And uh, Kiefer can do the backgrounds. Uh, you know what I mean? And you go to a lot of artists and you would make it animation of the highest possible quality. Um, and, and, and that way you can actually have everything because you can in animation, everything that Wagner asks for. I mean, if you think of Goethe Demerol, the, 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 last, um, the last work of the, of the Ring, I mean, in just the last 10 minutes, a woman, a goddess, a, a divine being on a horse, gallops onto a fire and sets herself and her horse on fire. In the background, the castle of the gods collapses and then the whole thing is covered in water as the Rhine comes up and on swim the Rhine maidens uh, and, 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 and win back the ring. All within 10 minutes this has happened on a stage. Well, how do you do that? I mean, it's unbelievable. And uh, amazingly people try and the music of course is what builds this stunning climax as, as Hagen sings Zurück zum Ring and, and um, vom Ring and uh, but but with animation you could actually do it. You could actually be under the water at the very beginning of Rheingold. You could yeah. you know you could have the dragons. You can have you know all the things of it that that on stage sometimes veer towards the comic. I mean, you know, a dragon on stage is is likely to raise a laugh unless you get it really right. You know, the smallest mistake, yeah, the smallest that. revelation. <laughs> of yeah. you know papier mache or something and and you're in trouble people just giggle so yeah. um you know the, the uh, so uh, yeah in my view as i say an animated ring would be just stunning with the best artists in the world creating creating the characters how did you feel about the use of um, wagner in apocalypse now well, it was, I mean, it, it's, one can't argue with its effect. I mean, unfortunately, it does mean whenever people hear the Ride of the Valkyries that they will think first of that moment. I mean, it's appropriate in as much as uh, Coppola understood that there was something in the music that suggests the flying, you know, the, um, mm. a, a, and it is the Valkyren Ritt, it is the Ride of the Valkyries, um, and those helicopters um, that they, you know, they, they, they and the music worked together. It, 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 it was so, it was so powerful, of course, that it forced a, a hardwired link in the brains of the culture, which means, as I say, that you can't hear much of that. In the same way, mind you, when people hear the Siegfried's Death March, they tend to think of some documentary involving Nazism, because whenever there's a shot of uh, 
tanks ram rumbling into Poland, or even worse, the chimneys of the death camps, they tend to have, you know, they tend to have that, um, that awful dum -dum, dum dum moment of the secret death march, you know, um, without the, the, the salvation of the trumpet and, uh, and, and Siegfried's theme coming out at the end. So, so there's, um, uh, yeah, th there are ways in which, uh, great art like that can be well I would not say ruined but uh, you know I mean it's it's true of Hamlet as well um, um, uh, people have come away from Hamlet saying it's all right but gosh he, he talks in cliches I mean really I mean considering you know <laughs> to the manner born who you I mean that's such a hackneyed <laughs> phrase uh, a cruel to be kind I mean come on Hamlet um, <laughs> <laughs> that with so many of the phrases have entered our language that they almost sound banal. Um, and, and of course, there's that famous story of Richard Burton's Hamlet when, when uh, he, was, uh, he came on and started to be, no, no, not to be. And there was a growling noise in, 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 in the front row and someone was joining in and he was just about to say, shut up. And he looked down and it was Winston Churchill, the prime minister, who was, um, who, who was joining in to be or not to be. Exactly. <laughs> And he knew it word but word by word, you know, perfectly. But a lot of people do. <laughs> and Burton thought, Jesus, even someone as noble and grand as, as as Churchill can't help joining in with to be or not to be. So, you know, uh, sometimes great works just take on their own life and their own cultural meaning. They become a they become something else, if you like. And uh, the job, therefore, of the uh, of the of the director is to rescue it um i mean but that's a wider reflection of what artists do anyway uh t.s Eliot described the job of the poet to purify the dialect of the tribe um and and that's the point is that uh, not just you know language is you know, this filthy rubbish as, as Eliot also called it you know it it is the styrofoam cups and the you know the dropped bits of plastic on the floor are the ordinary exchanges of language that people use and a poet has to take those same words that are constantly corrupted and polluted by being lazily and ordinarily exchanged between people and they have to turn that into art and and a visual artist has to turn the, the rubbish of the world around them into something into into an idea into a celebration or a denial or a denouncement or whatever it is um and and then it even goes towards the nature of the work of art itself so that when you get a work of art like hamlet or tristan or whatever it might be a director has to try to find something new in it or to to blow away the rust or maybe even to play um to play um, playfully with uh, with the very fact that the reputation. So you might you can see productions of Hamlet, in which you know so the, the people in it are aware of of the fact that they're inside something that people know. And so there's you know the point is there's no right or wrong approach. Uh, anything formulaic, anything methodological, who where people pronounce how things should be done. Uh, I am deeply wary of and distrustful of myself. Is it true, I was told, that you once liked prog music, prog rock? Yes, absolutely. Yes, I mean, I was of a generation, um, you know, um, I've heard people call, uh, especially inverted snob, uh, uh, radio, you know, BBC Radio Six disc jockeys uh, sneeringly call it public school rock because you know a lot of the performers uh, were at private schools in the early seventies and or late sixties and you know they came out like out of, came out of charter house like Genesis you know. Well, I can say if you uh, take Genesis out of the equation. Yeah, <laughs> left work. well, no, I agree. Led Zeppelin and so on. I mean, they come from Birmingham and they come from, you know, yeah. from, from, but yeah, I, it, it was the, t the preference for it, though. The love of ELP and, uh, and, and, and all of that was a very public school thing because uh, public school 
schoolboys had studies and they they were the first generation to have LP players, um, you know, proper in their studies. They could afford it because they were rich kids. And so they had a record collection of albums and they would sit there and we would, you know, you, if, if, if we were very naughty, we'd roll up a joint on the on the album cover uh, and on the album cover would be the lyrics and they would be influenced by William Blake and things like that. And, it, you know, it would be these Procol Harum and, uh, you know, easy to laugh at as pretentious and overblown and bombastic and pompous and all the rest of it. But, but you know, this was a very different way of enjoying music. It was a world away from the monkeys um, and, and, and the, the, the pop single. And so there was this period where the idea of a single was sneered at by us, you know, and our love of Pink Floyd or Aqualung, you know, and, you know, we loved the, the folk rock as well. And um, because you, apart from anything else, it was at least theatrical. It was crammed with ideas. It was crammed with invention. It tried new things. It, I mean, occasionally it was the result of the spoiled access to the whole toy box of a studio and an orchestra. And, and it was way overdone and had no taste and so on. There were lots of disastrous efforts. And we can, we can look back at the court of King Arthur or something and think, oh my God, what was Rick Wakeman thinking of? But, um, you know, at least he had a go. He wasn't just going jumpy, jumpy, jump with the same old backbeat with, with what was known in the, the bad days of uh, disco as Donna Summer's Bottom. In other words, that, that Giorgio Moroder bass line, you know, that was the same in everything. And um, at least there was that variety and difference and more like classical music, of course, Famously, um, Emerson, Lake and Palmer and others were very influenced by, by Bach and by, uh, by, by some, uh, some, some other classical musicians and by Pasha Bell's Canon and all those sort of things. They saw, wow, have you heard this chord change, <laughs> you know, which, which may have been 300 years old, but nonetheless was, uh, was exciting to a musician who had just picked up a guitar and taught himself that way. And, and so they were able to, you know, to go for the, uh, go for big ideas. Um, and then, by the end, by you know, then punk, you know, disco and punk came along, and uh, and glam rock, of course, was always there, and and uh, you know, it was also a uh, a great time for the gender bender. Uh, after all, we we think now that we've invented in the twenty first century this idea of fluidity of gender and so on, but but the Mark Bolands and uh, David Bowies and others who 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 were there way before. No um, really. Iggy's. And, and Lou Reed, absolutely huge influences these people, weren't they? It's by the way, when he did his breakthrough album, Rick Wakeman was actually playing on it. I didn't know that. And no. Steve Howe from Yes. Mm, mm, that's fascinating. Yes, I mean, you know, if you were to look at, I mean, Jimmy Page as a uh, as, as a sessions musician, you know, I mean, it's an extraordinary idea, isn't it? These people popping in and just adding backing vocals or guitar licks and things, and, and before they had made their own name, yeah. But it did make it a very interesting time. I mean, mm. mentioned Stravinsky before. Yes, always opened. I think, I think still open with Rites of Spring. Yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, the the of course the idea. There's a lot of envy you can have for for figures like that because because they were able to shock because they were able to do something new and. It's the fate of most artists to look around them and think everything new has been done. I can't, you know, although the desire purely to shock is a childish one, it is indicative of there being room in the space of your art to do something so new that people will be amazed in the way that they were by The Rise of Spring and indeed Firebird and, and, and the early um, ballets of uh, uh, Ballet Russe and so on. And, and by Facade in England, of course, that was the British equivalent moment, wasn't it? When William Walton's Facade was first produced, there was a riot and people were throwing things. You, you couldn't have a riot now, um, unless you, 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 I don't know, appeared at a stadium and, and had a, a, a cellist come on and, and, uh, and, and play some, uh, you know, some Bach cello suites they might people might no, start no. throwing bread rolls you know <laughs> but no, no. <laughs> it's happening isn't it yeah and of course we're now at a time when I mean it's it's, it's almost 20 years since uh, the first musical piece of AI was produced uh, that fooled someone a piece of Bach uh, or, or supposed Bach 
um, was played, was created by a, an AI and um, and put next to two pieces of real bark. So people had A, B, and C, and they they were told to choose the one that they thought was by machine, and um, and and they got it wrong. You know, they they against statistics, people people thought it was a piece of bark that had been done by AI. But that's that's uh that and that's been uh that's to say that was a long time ago but it was bach and bach followed rules in an extraordinary mathematical way the fact that he was such a great artist as well is astonishing so it is it is it's easy to see that some people might hear a piece of bach and think that's that's mechanical you know because it's so perfect and so so you know such an exquisite piece of clockwork you might think that's not human uh, you would never make that mistake i suspect with uh with, with beethoven or or indeed with um, with with, um, uh, with Led Zeppelin, <laughs> uh, but but uh, but the day will come. Of course, it will. In the same way that there are faces now that can be produced by uh, AI um, that uh, that we think may, may be real, um, and everything we see that AI does, it, when people go, no, oh, that's not very good. Remember that what we're looking at is the absolute foothills of AI. It's a bit like going back, I mean, you don't have to go back very far to look at an Atari and say, that's not very good resolution on that uh, on that Atari game uh, platform, is it? That doesn't, you know, it's a bit blocky and uh, it's, it's you know, not very, it's, you know, it's not even thousands of colors. It's pretty basic. So yeah. yeah, because it's the very beginning of the technology. You wait 10 years and 20 years and 30 years when it's absolutely 4K and, 3D and high res and that, yeah. And then wait another 10 or 10 to 20, 30 years. Everything is a work in progress. The idea that you can judge technology by where it is now is absurd. It would be like going back to 1898 at Carl Benz's first cars and say, I don't really think these will catch on. I mean, how are they going to, how are you going? You were saying women are gonna use these to go to work in the shops, are you mad? I said, well, wait a bit, it's gonna get better. You know, and people forget this. They always want to make a judgment on the way things are now. It's a bit like saying, this is the river when you're looking at one section of a riverbank. The river is the flow of the whole thing. And um, so the fact is you can't comment on art and the future unless you understand, even in the most basic way, what when people talk about unsupervised machine learning and uh, 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 all these, you know, different facets of uh, of artificial intelligence, and and of course not just artificial intelligence. That's that's really the point. Um, there is a, I, I, you know, it's like looking out to sea. Imagine you look out to sea, and before the tsunami comes, there are various swells that combine to make the tsunami. They all come together, different swells from different directions. And we have the swells of bio-augmentation. Am I boring you that much? No, oh, I'm just turning that off. Sorry. Oh, we, have, <laughs> we have the various swells of bio-augmentation and nanotechnology um, and genomics and gene editing um, and artificial intelligence, machine learning and quantum computing, all these things together, and new materials, graphene um, and, and others, nanotubes, quantum tunneling, all these different technologies are coming together um, to create the tsunami that will change everything. And it's not a question of that just saying, do you mean, I mean, I didn't even mention robotics, of course, that's the other one, but uh, uh, people confuse robotics with AI, which is not the same thing at all. So there's a, a, a huge amount of change coming, but then we've had a huge amount of change anyway within the generations of ourselves, our parents and our grandparents, your, your and I generations, parents and grandparents. We, we can all remember old people telling us about the first time they saw an airplane in the sky, can't we? I certainly can remember my great aunt talking about the first time she saw an airplane in, in the 1890s, mm -hmm. um, yeah. or rather the 1900s in that case, the first time she saw a car in the 1890s. So, you know, within our own lifetimes and generations, um, there's been enormous change, but there's been no change in humanity at all. Um, and that's true biologically. Uh, we haven't, we haven't evolved in a hundred years, how could we? That would be absurd. Um, that's not how evolution works. But, uh, and, and this, you know, this, these, these um, 
uh, ridiculous Lamarckian fallacies that we're going to have bigger thumbs or smaller thumbs or whatever it is because of the nature. Do you remember those you know, pe pe people who make these awful misunderstandings of evolution who think that acquired acquired changes can be passed on through the genes, which they can't. Um, it's only, you know, it's a, it's a, um, but, and, and humanity hasn't changed since the Greeks. It hasn't, you know, the ancient Can I ask you a question about that? Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with the book? And I'm, my brain isn't working well enough to remember the, the author, but it was called The Better Angels of Our Nature. Yes, Stephen Pinker. That's it, Stephen Pinker. Yeah. Um, his I know Stephen, he's a friend of mine. Sorry? His view seemed to be that we are becoming more compassionate, less violent. Yes, but he doesn't mean that evolutionarily. No. He doesn't mean that in terms of our actual cell structure and our actual brain wiring. It, he, he means culturally. He means, and, and, and this is the point, is that humanity is split between its desire. We are all split between our desire to be individuals absolutely autonomous individuals who think of ourselves as individuals. It's a development of the culture of the romantic self um, from, the, from the early 19th century, really, onwards. This idea of the self, uh, uh, obviously hugely uh, uh, developed by Freud and others, um, and into the narcissism of the, of the current world. Um, the idea of the self um, is, is huge, but at the same time uh, has been a... Um, um, a sense of us as part of a group, a, a democracy, a country, a tribe, a clan, um, a community, so that your gender, your sexuality, your race, uh, even your various other preferences, even the time at which you were born gives you an identity. So you're a boomer, you're a, you're a millennial, you're a generation Z, all these preposterous identities that, that are given to people that make them part of a cluster of people. So you're part of this cluster, this group, and you're also this individual. And there's a vast tension in that, a tension between our individuality and our, our, our socializing um, identities. Um, and that, is, th that hasn't changed. And I think what, I mean, Stephen is, uh, he wrote Better Angels, and then he wrote another book called Enlightenment Now, which followed it, both uh, w which developed its idea and and Stephen was then called you know one of the new optimists because he genuinely laid out in both the better angels of our nature and in uh, enlightenment now this idea that yet yeah, we are improving that science enlightenment reason understanding communication all these technology all these things are bringing us closer together and our commitments to the education of women and to the um, uh, eradication of malaria and various other diseases and and of the improvements in the third world were, were bearing fruit. The um, United Nations Sustainable Goals were working. Um, more women were being educated in, you know, uh, um, 2018 uh, than in 2017 and more in 2017 and 2016, and nearly double the number in 10 years of women being educated. All the in indicators were looking good for suggesting the world was coming, well, you know, was, was improving because of these global forces like the United Nations Sustainable Goals and the spread of liberal economics. By liberal economics, of course, we don't mean liberal with a political L. It means the freedom of markets, the, the free market. It, it, it economy was, was working, it seems. Now, even at the moment he wrote it, suddenly everything seemed to fall apart <laughs> because um, suddenly uh, it, it, there was uh, a, a great tranche of the world was taken over by populist politicians, nativists, who were not interested in globalization and the um, organs of globalization like UNESCO and UNICEF and uh, the, the UN and uh, WHO. And they wanted to remove themselves from that, as Trump famously did from almost all of them. And he hated NATO and he hated uh, the climate change conference in, in Paris and the accords that had been reached. And suddenly the very things that Steven Pinker had been celebrating looked much more fragile agile and tenuous and contingent and provisional and um, so there's a it's an interesting question now as to whether that optimism whether those developments whether the advances of, of, of an internationalist way of looking at, uh, at ourselves have now fallen back uh, and of course that doesn't even take into account the pandemic and its disastrous effects and we don't know what the effects will be 
on the um, on the political ambitions and aspirations of of the countries of the world, all of whom have been affected by this. But one um, of you, the you, astonishing you, things yeah. about the pandemic, it, mm. it probably isn't the first, but it must be the first that while it was in its full flush, they came up with multiple solutions. Yes. I think that's true. I mean, um, absolutely. I mean, they all recognise the same scientific facts about the nature of uh, um, the nature of the uh, of the uh, of the virus itself. But they, yeah, they do approach different ways. It's it, yeah, it's like do we um, do we go for D Day or do we go for the Eastern Front? <laughs> you know, the, uh, the, 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 you you do attack on different fronts. You attack via the protein spike or via the RNA or via the usual vaccination idea of, uh, of, of using depleted um, de depleted infection to, to build up antibodies and, and and yeah it is interesting to watch the but of course really for, for us I suspect for us non-scientists the most interesting science behind uh, all of this is not virology it's not epidemiology um, it's behaviorology it's how governments persuade their populations to behave in a way that is advantageous for the wider population, but which is a pain for the individual. And again, well, you know, what I said about the, the tension between the individual and the group um, is, is very apparent in that. The, um, uh, the fact of statistics that I find so interesting is that and Sherlock Holmes, funny enough, commented on that in, in, in the second Sherlock Holmes novel. Uh, he said to Watson, it is one of the most extraordinary things about us as a people is that the statistician can predict to an extraordinary level of accuracy how any group of people will behave. But it can never predict how an individual will behave. And that is true. You can say with absolute accuracy and advertising and various other things depend on it, that... 17% of the population will do this if, if we send out this message. But you cannot say this person will do this if we send out the message. Yeah. You, you can't control the individual, but you can weirdly control the group. So, it, it, and it's a, a, a nature of, of, of science and cultural understanding that we're only just beginning to address. Um, we're looking at, for example, it starts with flocking and shoaling you know you look at murmurations of starlings and you think are they controlled by each individual or is it the group and how does the group get the individuals to behave in such a way that they don't bang into each other there isn't time for them to send a message for the for the flock of the, the murmuration of the starlings to turn into this shape and the same with the mackerel in their shoal well now fortunately we can look at the brains of these creatures and you can see that it is tiny algorithm, a tiny algorithm, and I know, you know, the actual mathematical formula is that big, the, the terms of the formula are very small, a bit like um, uh, as they are in recursive geometry and in fractals and Mandelbrot series and things, a small, tiny little uh, thing in the brain that you just operate these rules, this is the algorithm like that, and if this, then this, if this, then this, otherwise return to this, you know, a tiny little uh, command to execute, a little loop. And, and it can do something as astounding and huge and beautiful and amazing as a murmuration of starlings, which is, and that is only the tiniest example of what is behind the nature of a group. An economy is a group. Uh, um, and um, uh, the, the whole nature of where a country is and its happiness and its voting and its feelings. Oh, this is group behavior, group activity, group dynamics, as they sometimes call it. And these can be controlled by very small things in an individual. So we don't even know we've got it, but we flock and we shoal and we, we do equivalents of flocking and shoaling, um, but not knowing we're doing it uh, when we react with other people, but we are social. And even though people can be antisocial and grumpy and want to live alone and secluded, as you know, our DNA makes us creatures that flourish best in groups. Um, and you know, it'll be interesting to see when the lockdown ends, won't it? Because uh, we, we're having this taken away from us. And it's one of the 
one of the awful tortures you can do to a human being is to make them alone or deny them human company and deny them the satisfaction of having their place in the order of things with others, a family and then a clan and then a tribe and then a, another kind of grouping, a village or a town or a county, and then indeed a, a nationality in which we invest pride and we, we have symbols and artifacts that represent our place inside this group. Um, but we've also seen animals, um, you know, that have been brought up in zoos because they were orphaned, an orphaned chimpanzee, for example, and it's released into the wild and it's prepared for the wild where it will join a troop and it won't be a, a chimpanzee until it is part of a troop. In the same way as you'll never be a human until you are part of the human family. Um, and, uh, and yet what happens, of course, is they're finally taken out into their, in the cage and popped out in the wild. And then there's a long string and they all get back behind into, into cover and they pull the string and the cage opens and the chimpanzee stays there. Of course, it doesn't want to go out. It's terribly afraid to join its natural habitat and it's afraid of its own people. And many of us will be like that when seclusion opens. We'll go out into the street, we'll go, ah, and run back again. We don't want... But I've enjoyed our conversation. Um, <laughs> Thank you very much. Pleasure. Bye-bye then. I'll send you a copy. Do, Roger. I'd love to see it. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.